Well, welcome everyone to today's podcast. Do we have a special guest for you today? Dr. Olivia Rushk from the Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And he's laughing because I always get that wrong. But he's affectionately known around the university as Dr. Ollie. Olivia, welcome. Yeah, Rob, good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Really, really appreciate it. Mate, you're a bit of a legend locally where you live, but for all those guests who are listening from overseas, where in Australia do you live? So I currently live in uh, southwest Sydney around the uh, Macquarie Fields, uh, Glenfield area. And uh, for a lot of people who know Sydney in a way, it's a bit of a low socioeconomic area, while it was for a long period of time. And uh, yeah, I was, I was um, ra- born and raised uh, around Campbelltown and uh, raised for most of my life around Glenfield and Macquarie Fields. And uh, growing up, you see a lot of uh, different um, instances of, or different uh, perspectives of life. We're not very far away from the Housing Commission area in Macquarie Fields. So uh, people who live a, a very sort of poor and neglected life and every now and then going to the shops here and there near Macquarie Fields, you do see the odd occasional person who, you know, high drug use, alcohol abuse and all that type of stuff as well. And for a long period of time, just a lot of general Anglo-Saxon type of communities, but that's really much changed in the last 15 or so years. Now you've got Samoan grocery store, Indian grocery stores, Chinese grocery stores. Uh, for my family in particular, it's, it's a bit of a, a familiar feeling considering where they came from in the island of Mauritius when they immigrated there from the 1980s, where it was already a melting multicultural pot anyway. But um, yeah, it's, it's a nice, quiet area and uh, really, really nice, not far from Liverpool and whatnot. So it's a long way from you being a postdoctorate in archaeology and going to Egypt, which we'll get to later in the podcast. Yeah. So based on what you sent through to me, you just went to a local school? Yeah, yeah, uh, a couple of different ones. Um, so in, initially when growing up, I uh, had learning difficulties diagnosed with when I was born, uh, semantic pragmatic uh, disorder or semantic pragmatic speech disorder. And it's actually a mild form of autism. So I was sent to a school called New Warra Public School in uh, Moorbank. And I was chucked into uh, English as a second language class to start from kindergarten. So I was there for a couple of years because uh, growing up, I didn't have really good motor skills to understand my parents at times because they were speaking French Creole to me all the time, but my English wasn't that fantastic. And uh, with this particular condition, I really didn't have great motor skills, great social skills to interact, no eye contact and that sort of sense. So because of those conditions, I was chucked into this ESL class, I think for three years at least. Um, And then it wasn't until I think year one, that uh, year one or year two that I was transitioned to a normal class um and uh yeah then got sent to ingleburn public school where it was a lot closer for my parents to be able to uh, pick me up and drop me off at school as well and then lasted there until 2003 2002 and then st greg's college from 2003 to 2008 and so uh most people yeah. think of archaeologists you i've been told that you you were pretty of a brainiac at school and you were number one in class and to get where you got you must have had all of those uh other kids looking at you going, this guy's going to be, you know, the, the number one in the whole school and he's, he's going to be leading the world. Is that what actually happened or was it a little bit tougher being in an all boys school? No, nah, it was, um, it was good. It was, a, it was a great for me experience. I wasn't necessarily the number one brainiac student. I had, there was a couple of very talented, hardworking individuals throughout my time at Greg's who, you know, always look up to today and good on them with where they've gone in their lives yeah. as well. Um, but I was never that top, top student, maybe in some subjects, especially, but I know for sure, like I was one of the top students for history, at least uh, from year seven, um, all the way to sort of like year nine, uh, year 10, always had a love for it. Mm-hmm. And I have to give credit to my teachers I had at St. Greg's, especially year seven, Mr. Blundell, Mr. Baz from year eight, uh, partially year nine, Mr. Diomedes, year 10. I apologize. I forgot my name of my teacher in year 11. And of course, uh, Mr. Nelson, good old Mr. Nelson in year 12 uh, as well. So it was great where I enjoyed history because the aspect of just learning about stories of the human past. And I think coupled well with um, my understanding of my faith in God as well, going to church, um, (laughs) listening to the gospel readings every week. And my family is very, very um, Catholic based in that sort of sense. But at the same time, having this, um, this sort of, 
conflict, if you will, if I can express it as that. As yeah. you can see, my virtual background is of me with a Giganotosaurus uh, skeleton, which I saw in Atlanta in the US uh, like mid last year. And I had a massive love for dinosaurs in that yeah. sort of sense. So in listening to church and understanding human history, I'm like, where did, where did these guys fit in the Bible? Yep. Uh, where, where did it all happen? <laughs> so get, getting a real fanaticism about them in the beginning sort of led me to sort of appreciating chronologies, timelines, categories, if you will. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I, some people would ask me, well, why didn't you become a paleontologist? And I, I don't know, it sort of shifted in school because I think at the time when I was early on in Greg's, I was bullied quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and history, doing history classes gave me that wonderful sense of confidence in myself, knowing that I was really, really good at something. And through the amazing environment that my teachers gave me and, you know, encouraging me to keep going, it was something that I really, really loved and enjoyed. So I always looked forward to the history classes. Some years were good, other years were not. But especially in the lead up to like year 12, I was like, nah, this is a subject I really want to do and, um, and just get on with it, really. So before we move on to past school, a couple of quick questions. Yeah. I spoke to some other boys that have been to the same school as you when I was doing a bit of digging behind the scenes oh, yeah. on who really Dr. Ollie was. Mm. What they, they said it was a tough school yeah. and bullying was part of it, but not bullying the same way that we have today. It was part of the culture. Yeah. A part of in those days it was called making you a man. Uh, Maybe that not the right terminology now, but mm. if you look at that and you look at the other experiences at school, what would be the two things that you most fondly remember or made you who you are today from your school days? Good question. Um, first and foremost, um, I would say the school ethos at times helped me to get through some instances, but and what's that? Uh, basically, around the the motto. Uh, Quae semen arboris metes, what you sow so shall you reap from Latin. And it was something that I really held high to, to what I truly believe. And of course, relating to what my parents have done for me since I was a young kid uh, as well, where you work hard, you create your own luck. And in mm. many ways, you will get rewarded for that. Um, I guess that was one thing that sort of kept my chest quite a bit. I thought, listen, if I can just work hard on my work and uh, especially building the relationships I had in school too, even though I was bullied quite a bit, I think there was a point in time because I was seeing a school counselor for a number of years at Greg's and I'm still in contact with him today. He's a fantastic yeah. man, really appreciate his guidance and presence during those years because he really did a lot of work to work with my parents, which is what most counselors should be doing today because it's one thing where the school acts where the child will act in a way at school will be completely yep. different at home. So you wanted yep. to get an idea of both sides of the story. So, so you were good boy at school and a naughty boy at home? Uh, <laughs> between the two, like I listened, being the eldest child of three, like I would always try to be, you know, listening to my parents and doing right by them as always as yeah. possible. But I, but I always have a cheeky side, no matter what. That, that always hasn't has, changed? That hasn't changed, no. You know, my mum will give me some stick every now and then because of it, especially when I started growing the beard a few years ago. She's yeah. like, you look so much better without it. I'm like, I'm not giving it up. That's your problem. That's, uh, <laughs> but I, I dearly love her in the regardless anyway. But, you know, it's just one of those things. But, um, but going back to the question, um, I would say the ethos of Greg's helped me to get through it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, those school counseling years, especially just understanding about how to build relationships and trying to understand, like, if I want respect given to me, I had to give it back. So there were times that hmm. I would, you know, interact with different groups around my grade. Um, you know, I was always hanging around with my mates who I still love dearly today. Um, they're amazing in their own ways, but I also thought like, if I wanted to interact better with other people, I needed to go out and uh, socialize with other people. It was hard at times, you yeah. know, some people were initially like, what are you doing here and whatnot? But I just, I just wanted to get to know people, um, create conversations, whether it be through touch footy, handball, yeah. those types of things. And I think it was a good turning point from year 10 where I think I sort of getting it right, I guess. And then from there made year 11 and year 12 really, really awesome in terms of the social life and getting to know people a lot better. And, um, but, you know, I, I, can, I can understand from a lot of boys' point of view, it is tough. It is tough when you're in an all-boys school. Yeah. Um, but I think without those years, I wouldn't be who I am today. It's as simple as that. And I don't regret 
anything that has happened at Greg's, it's just, it's just part of, it's just part of life and forever what will happen down the track as well. Like um, these experiences are helping you to, I guess, be a more, more uh, not just tougher with yourself, but more emotionally intelligent as you go on and just being the man who you can be today. So we're looking at where you are today. Did you get bitten by the archaeology bug at school or did that come later? Came later. Um, funny enough, every time um, people ask me like, oh, was it Indiana Jones that uh, bit the bug for you? But actually, I didn't watch any of the films until literally year 11. I really didn't. Maybe I saw snippets, but it wasn't a huge reason for me to jump into the archaeology bandwagon and getting mm. the hat and the whip and all that type of stuff. Not necessarily. I think first and foremost, that love of history uh, and, and mm. loving studying that in high school really set me on the path again with church as well then on top of that understanding how we got such a long history dating back to the dinosaurs but where did humans fit in all of that so it wasn't until like when i was 16 years old my dad he, he works in the city and he was just walking around somewhere in the rocks and he came across an archaeology site yeah. that was happening in the rocks area and he came across an archaeologist who was leading the program and at the time in year 10 for most guys at St. Greg's, you had to apply to get some work experience being done over two weeks as part of um, completing year 10. Yeah. So I was looking for an opportunity and dad like, oh, I came across this guy and told him you're looking for work experience. And yeah, he said he would be happy to grab you on board, just get in contact with him and sort something out. Uh, his name is Wayne Johnson. He is part of the, um, he's the curator of the Rocks Museum over there and is still a cool mentor I constantly uh, keep in contact with. And just um, invited me to work with him for two weeks uh, back then. That's, um, I forget what the name of the, uh, the sector of the New South Wales government is now, but Wayne's yeah. in charge of basically organising the heritage around uh, Sydney Harbour, the Foreshore Authority and all that type of stuff. And basically took me under his wing to just have an understanding about what's what's life like in the office, categorizing artifacts at a local storage yeah. center and all of this. And to be perfectly honest, I thought it was like it's a, bit, a little bit boring because I'm working with Australian historical stuff. There's not a lot there at times, but I had an appreciation for the categorization of things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, the rocks is, is one of the oldest parts, as in settlement parts in Australia. It's where... Uh, the fleets first came in and set up and it's got yeah. some of the oldest physical buildings apart from our indigenous heritage in the whole of the country. How did you go from there to Macquarie Uni and end up specialising in archaeology? Because, I mean, if anyone looks at you, walk down the street, you don't look like an archaeologist. <laughs> you're 29. You have, you're teaching at one of the best universities in the country. How did you get to uni and how did you get to where you be a PhD? Oh, mate. I will say this. Hard work, persistence, a lot of tears, uh, yeah. and just doggone persistence, and faith as well, and a good yeah. support network. I will say this. Like, from that experience, um, working with Wayne, it just, I sort of, I just never knew archaeology was a thing you could do, actually. Even though I was studying history, I just thought historian, yeah. that's it, you know? But working with Wayne, I was like, oh, yeah, there's archaeology. I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that. Because everybody, yeah. you know, in year 10 to year 11 and 12 at the time, they were like, oh, I'm going to be this. I'm going to aim towards that, depending on what UAC preferences we were aiming for and all these discussions we would have with mm -hmm. our pastoral meetings and all this type of stuff. And so I just, I just gunned onto this and was looking at different university opportunities and whatnot. And, uh, of course, UCID came up, University of Sydney. Um, but I felt when you had the orientation day happening here and there, like I just felt like, I don't know, I didn't feel uh, I fitted with the environment that was there. No, no disrespect to University yeah. of Sydney, but I guess coming from where I came from in Southwest Sydney, especially in Western Sydney, I didn't really have a feel for like the multicultural environment that was there. I don't I'm know. I'm just going to interrupt you there yeah. in case people are listening to this who have been to uni or are looking at uni or just started uni. Mm. How important is it for you to be a cultural fit and be comfortable where you're studying? Very important. I mean, everybody, maybe this is just my opinion, but I, I don't know. It's something that maybe personally you have to feel for yourself when you go to the campuses, talking with the people. Mm. But I felt like, I think because, I don't know, it's something that cannot be explained. It really has to sit well with the person themselves and not mm. just in terms of what course they want to do, 
but that other side of it, like, can you see yourself within that environment, the, the feel of the lifestyle of that university or institution, that sense where you're going to be dedicating a number of years? Because it's not just studying that you're going to be doing over there. It's going to be some of the best years of your life. And you want to make sure that this is an environment where you can thrive and grow in those years and learn more about yourself and your early adult years. So for Macquarie, for example, when I got there, first and foremost, it's a very green campus. Love it because of that. And I could tell I could be interacting with loads of mm -hmm. different people from all walks of life, from the conversations that I had on orientation days that were there as well. And then on top of that, like the degree I wanted to do, a Bachelor of Ancient History, it was like, okay, this is where I want to be. Now, to answer your question again as to how I jumped from archaeology to doing Egyptian archaeology from all of that, yeah. I, will, I will have to say I credit my... Uh, year 12 ancient history teacher, uh, Mr. Nelson, because basically for our year 12, we had uh, two topics we learned for our entire HSC. We learned about Pompeii and uh, Herculaneum and all this. I thought that was fine. That's okay. That was compulsory at the time. And then he did a funny trick where he just made sure that the other three components we had to do for HSC were just about one civilization. And that was uh, ancient Assyria. And that was just basically in the Near East. And they were they were the ones who were sort of the ancestors of the Persians. Um, so we did a whole heap of that type of stuff. So I got a taste of what studying the middle of the, the Near East was like. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of attracted to that sense. So I figured like based on doing Year 12 Ancient History, I thought, okay, if Macquarie is offering a Bachelor of Ancient History, I should be able to study Assyria there. But that wasn't the case. It was just all Egypt, Egypt, most of Egypt, of course, there yep. was Rome, Greece, and a whole lot of different other civilizations that could study. But of course, uh, Egyptian archaeology was the big jewel in the crown, especially um, because, I mean, hell, <laughs> Egypt as a, as a civilization, it's just enamored with a lot of different people around the world. You know about the pyramids, you know about the temples that they have there, you know about the amazing works that these people had done thousands upon thousands of years ago. And a lot of aspects that they did is still very much present in our modern society today. So that sort of led me down that path. But I can say this, when I first started Macquarie, I wasn't so fascinated by studying Egyptian archaeology. I still thought like, oh yeah, it's all good. And I had to study Egyptian hieroglyphs, still don't like it today. But the archaeology sense of it, in mm -hmm. terms of like understanding the artifacts and getting all of that, there was um, a lecturer who... I am in contact with today who was uh, lecturing about early archaeology for Egypt. And then she left after a year and she was replaced by my current mentor and PhD supervisor or former PhD supervisor, now Jan Tristan. And he came in with such a vibe. Uh, he was a prehistoric archaeologist, but working in Egypt. And that was completely foreign to a lot of the staff members that were there in a way. Um, and basically in this time period, a hieroglyph is not a very prominent thing you can refer to because mm. there's not much writing from around 5,000 to 3,000 BC, if you can think of that. So because of his enthusiasm with his subject, one time he just said to me like, why don't you specialize more with uh, prehistoric Egyptian archaeology? I thought, sure, why not? There's no hieroglyphs. So I'll jump into that. And then from there, just, it just went from there pretty much. And um, I, I, I have to say like without Jan's support and assistance, I wouldn't be where I am right now today. So I am really humbly and very grateful for his presence in my life. Now, now the oldest ruins I've been are to the ones over in Vietnam. And the, uh, yeah. uh, where that's the jewel there. India and Vietnam have a World Heritage site over there. I'm sure you've been there or read about them. And to touch those ruins, for someone like me who knows very little, about what you study apart from listening to you intently, you touch the ruins and something goes through you. It's like an energy. It's, mm. uh, it's amazing for someone like me who just walks up, just wants to, it's as though they take you back to where they were. How do you get that? You're now a teacher, mm. you lecture there, you've been a, a student. We'll get on to you in a minute about you being over actually in Egypt and some of your fun and games over there. <laughs> How do you teach something like that where you can't touch a pharaoh, you can't touch a mummy. You're standing up there and you're looking at kids going, you know, I want to be interested. How do you sell that to the kids? How do you make them, or not make them, how do you keep them interested? I would say that uh, many years ago, it would depend on the passion of the person mm -hmm. presenting, whatever pictures you had, how you really sold the content to the students. 
Nowadays, we're in a very, very um, lucky situation where part of archaeological work now involves a lot of photogrammetry, 3D scanning, where you go on the site, you take a heap of photos, you create 3D models um, to actually showcase some of wow. the artifacts or features that, you can, that we work with on site. And from that, we do create learning resources that students can actually interact with with their learning content as part of the learning year that they have enrolled with. So you so, can actually put up on the screen a 3D image of a tomb that you may have been to over in Luxor or somewhere like that. Yeah, for sure. Of course, it depends on where you get it from, but we've been lucky enough with the excavations I've worked with under my supervisor, Jan, at uh, some of the sites in Egypt, where photogrammetry work is a huge part of his uh, methodologies and uh, excavating processes in mm -hmm. Egypt. And I've been lucky enough to learn uh, quite a bit about those processes where we've, I've helped him to do loads of photos of tombs mm -hmm. and be able to piece them together as 3D models. So I would use these actually in class. Um, but I would, say, I would say that's one aspect. But before all these 3D models, just to sort of bring back mm -hmm. to the original point, we, would, we are very lucky at Macquarie where we have a museum of ancient cultures where we can actually bring some of the artifacts uh, from that museum to mm. actually allow students to handle those. At the moment, the museum is kind of currently going through renovation, so we're pretty limited on what artifacts we can bring in class. But that was usually the method at Macquarie, especially for our ancient history uh, classes that yeah. teach archaeology. So we actually do allow the students to handle the artifacts in class. We teach them about what are some of the questions you can ask about these artifacts? Where did they come from? Uh, what data are they? What is the context? What was their function? These mm. little instances. And once you get an idea of that formula, you can really ask these questions of any artifact that comes from any part of the world. Archaeology has this interesting formula where at the end of the day, you're trying to get an understanding about human civilizations around the world and the stories that they tell through the things that they have left behind. We won't be able to know everything, but some of the clues that they have left behind, maybe clues to their success, yeah. we can interpret, we can bring to life. And there's so many ways you can do that these days as well. As I mentioned, 3D modeling and all that type of stuff. But sometimes the most important aspect is the essence of touch. Um, yeah. Or some archaeologists I know can say, you can actually taste it if you want, but that's another story. Um, but in essence, the essence of touch is such an important thing. And we're very lucky in Macquarie to have that aspect. So, but I have to say, passion, experience, a good knowledge of the content, that's so important. And trying to get it in such an engaging way to bring your students involved with the conversation instead of just you just talking to them mm. the entire time. That's something that you can be trained with, but it's something that is a, if it's something that's very important for you to be able to teach the students and also learn from them at the same time, engaging them in, as part of a conversation rather than just as a lecture, that for me is very, very important no matter what type of class I'm teaching or maybe any interaction that I'm having with anybody really. And when I'm teaching people and coaching people in sales, we talk, mm. we've got a process, we've got a product. It's a lot easier. I'm looking at archaeology. You've been overseas. How do you sell to someone, hey, I'd like to get some funding to go overseas to dig in Egypt? I mean, how do you transform that that it must be one of the hardest sales calls of using my terminology that you could possibly make. Cause if they don't understand your vision, you've got to sell it and you get one go and there's not a lot of research funds out there. And this is a passion of yours. So how do you do it? Oh mate, it's, it's a complicated process. And it's, it's funny how you bring in the whole analogy to sales, especially with entrepreneurship in that sort of sense. If you think about it, archeologists were some of the original entrepreneurs <laughs> uh, from centuries ago because Hundreds of years ago, they would have to make a pitch to a potential investor where it would be somebody who had like an amazing trust fund or someone who was attached to a university, uh, sorry, attached to a museum, mm. sorry, where they would say to the museum, hey, I'm going to be digging this place, whether it be Cambodia, Southeast Asia, Egypt, uh, maybe North America or South America for that matter. I'm going to go on this dig. If you give me this amount of funds, I will be able to bring back these artifacts for your institution as a, as a return of this payment. So in a sense... Um, that was the deal back then. Nowadays, it's a lot harder because you're just, you're just investing money for research in that sort of sense. I just handed in a grant. Uh, I just handed in a grant proposal this past weekend. Yeah. And part of the aspect is, is that, of course, you need to have some aims down pat, like, um, of course, what you're going to be doing at the site. 
but then also trying to bring in a sort of generalized worldview of like, what is this research going to achieve? And you have to really weave in a story that links with what the institution is looking for, whether it's yep. like, is this going to help like, um, how should I explain this? Is this going to help with increasing our awareness of the past so it can help solve future problems? I mean, in essence, like... Is that the story of what archaeology really is all about? What they can teach us today? You know, the problems that were before? Very much, if you really want to look deep into it. Because yeah. at the end of the day, we're all human. And yeah. there's so many different problems that 5,000 years ago, they were trying to figure out. And we're still trying to figure out today. Um, especially, I feel, um, different communications, interactions between people of, say, different nations, different mm. races... And as you can see in this current climate we're in at the moment, we're still trying to figure this out. We're seeing what's happening in America at the moment where some people just don't seem to know or seem to be educated or trained pro properly in how to properly interact with people of different cultural backgrounds. And instead of just trying to make a solution on the spot, it's like, can we find a way to understand how can we help you? I guess in your field as well, coming from a salesman's point of view, you don't just go in like, here, I've got a product, I've got something I can immediately help you. It's like, no, 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 you have to ask your potential clients, like, what are the problems you're going through? And what, are, what type of solutions are you looking for to address this problem and seeing whether is it something, a product that you can help them with? Or maybe yep. you know somebody in that sort of sense. And that way you build this trust to build this relationship. You might not sell them something in that instance, but maybe later down the track because you've built that relationship so far, Long term, that's an amazing investment. And I find that building relationships in that sort of sense is something that you see from the past as well. And I've come across like a physical archaeological type of evidence that can suggest how people legitimized these relationships as mm -hmm. well. So, for example, um, 5,000 years ago, before the Giza pyramids were even built, we had tombs that belonged to what we call elite people or people who may have served the earliest kings. Yep. And in order for them to exemplify their status, if you will, it wasn't just having a big tomb. It was also, you had to have an understanding of like, who are these people, what education that they had, but like how we see how people have such a big, uh, a big effort or a big um, focus on social media, like Instagram, Facebook, uh, MySpace hmm. from an age ago. People determined your importance based on how many followers you had, because depending on that largest amount of followers, it sort of gave you some sort of status in the world because people sort of look to you as someone with such authority, whether it be research, sports, celebrityness, I have no idea. But based on that large amount of followers, that sort of contributed to your status as someone high in your own society. So some things really haven't changed. No, they haven't. So with the tombs I was referring to earlier, you have people who are actually buried around um, either tombs that belong to kings yeah. or people who may belong to this elite group. And so they physically showed that they had some of these tombs had hundreds of these tombs that were there and sort of represent that they had these followers that may have been connected to them through maybe family relations or maybe relations that were not familial, but was sort of like maybe, um, uh, I forgot the word, but something that was of a non-kinship, not not a non, uh, not a blood-related type of relationship. But they were they were they had that relationship based on the people's merit and what they meant uh, to the patron, if you will, no, patronage. That's yeah. the word. So yeah, you've been sort of you've been to Egypt a few times now. Yeah. Um, to a layman, if I said to you, where has been your favourite site that you've been to, and what did the locals teach you? Uh, I will have to say the first site I ever dug in Egypt will remain my favorite because it gave me my introduction. Yeah. Um, Abra Wash, which is current, which was the project of my supervisor, Jan. Yes. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting introduction to Egypt because just to give you context, that was when uh, President Morsney was under a mm -hmm. bit of a black cloud and he was yes. actually getting kicked out of office in 2013. So we were already entering in this sort of very conflict heavy uh, zone, if you will. There was already tension happening. But I will say is that we were very far away from all the action that was happening right. in Tahi Square in Cairo. We we're very far away and we we're just camping on a hill that just oversaw the whole amount of Cairo from the uh, mm. West Bank of the Nile. Yep. 
And we had the amazing privilege to work with uh, local Egyptian workers around 20 to 25 of them or 30 odd. And it was Ramadan during that time. Wow. And uh, it would have been hot too, wouldn't it? Sorry, what was that? It would have been hot too, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 for sure. So June, July is the summer in Egypt. And these guys, yep, they would still be practicing Ramadan even when they were working with us in 40 degree heat. They, wow. would, they would do their drinking, eating before and uh, underneath the Rais Muhammad uh, Hassan, who was the, the main leader, the Rais yeah. is who is known as the leader of the workers. And they, they were teaching me a lot about resilience and just getting the job done despite these hardworking uh, circumstances because that was for them, that was their work. And they just continually did that uh, even though uh, also their faith had to call them to another mm another uh, call of duty, if you will, while they were working with us. And a lot of these guys, some of these guys who are very good specialist workers actually taught me how to dig. Um, in, at Macquarie, in my early years, there wasn't any specific classes that actually taught you how to do these things. So a lot so of- So you went to Bunnings, did you? Or? <laughs> I mean, I, I could find the tools there, but to actually <laughs> properly dig with like a toothbrush or even like a small scalpel or something of that nature, these locals, they were, they were descendants of generations of workers who have worked with some of the earliest archaeologists in the early 1900s. So they've yeah. been taught from generation to generation about how to work. And um, some of them were very friendly, uh, teaching me uh, how to speak Arabic properly as well, which is <laughs> still working on it, but they're very, very patient. And that, that was the other thing. Resilience and patience is what they really taught me by working with them. And I, I have really good memories from that. And some yep. workers from that team, I'm still in contact with when I go to Egypt every now and then as well. Now, the listeners wouldn't allow me to get away with that saying to you, did you yeah. dig anything interesting up? Uh, Aberwash, we did. I, uh, we had the amazing discovery of uh, digging up a, a wooden funerary boat. Now, people will think like, a boat? Really? It's, is that really interesting? Yeah, it is. In the desert. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, yeah. Um, because let's face it, the Egyptians, they loved life so much that they wanted to take everything from their life and just bury it with them because they had to be prepared mm. for the afterlife in that sort of sense. Because life was very good to them with the Nile River just giving them everything. Yeah. So in essence, they had to prepare for what they thought would be another waterway in the afterlife. So they actually buried boats with them, especially for those who could afford it. And before that discovery, um, usually wooden boats with tombs, they were usually found with king's tombs or anything related to royal uh, funerary structures. So my supervisor, Jan, he just came across some interesting notes in his study of the site at Aberol Wash. Mm. And uh, previous archaeological reports reported that, oh, they found wooden planks in the north of some of the tombs. And he was late at night going, what is this? What, why are there wooden planks? And that's, his, that's his French You do that very board. well. Oh, thank you. He would hate. He would hate to know that I'm doing it again. Anyway, so uh, I take a I take a real good Mickey out of his accent, and a lot of people enjoy it too. But he he has fun with it. But based on his his study, um, they were able to find a number. Of, they actually found one of these funerary boats in 2012, and when I joined him in 2013, they found three more of those. And thanks to some radiocarbon dating that they did at the New Giza uh, Museum, they have a laboratory attached to that where they did some radiocarbon yeah. dating they found that, yeah, they had found the oldest funerary boats ever found in Egyptian archaeological history and especially belonging to people who were not kings at all. So it gives you an idea that even as far back as like 2800 BC, 5,000 years ago, people had already an idea about trying to figure out what is beyond death? What are some of the things that we need to prepare for? Because there's something so unknown to them and they're just very things that were so familiar to them that they had comfort in knowing that it was going to be with them to prepare for a world of unknowns. So it just shows you that despite the difference in time, we all have a lot of vulnerabilities that we try to neglect, but to comfort us with these vulnerabilities, we put a lot of support systems in place, whether it be that be religion, other people, our own moral compass, who knows? We all go through this because let's face it, we don't know everything, Rob. We no. really don't. And death is one of those things that... We don't know. We don't know. But all we can just do is focus on what we have in the present moment and just live our lives as best as possible. That's true. Now, we're back in Australia. Yeah. I see you're stuck here at the moment because we can't go anywhere. No. <laughs> for a little while yet, hopefully in the new year. What's next for Dr. Ollie, as we love to call him? What's your next challenge? Because you have achieved so much already. 
but knowing you and the drive you've got, you're only just starting. Uh, what's going to be the next chapter for Ollie? For me, it's, it's about just looking for, just looking for an occupation that can allow me to continue doing my archaeological work and to help me grow further as a person. I understand money is very important, especially in the current mm -hmm. circumstances that we're in. But if you're going to focus on that first, you're going to have a very, very hard time. True. And I, I firmly believe I want to be in a job that's involved with education um, that can allow me to help others, uh, especially if they come from backgrounds which are less fortunate for them. So I've got a number of jobs that I've applied for at this moment. Hopefully, I'll get some good news from that. But for now, because I'm an honorary postdoctoral associate at Macquarie University, I'm just helping to support the research profile of the university. I've got some articles in place based on my PhD work. Yeah. Um, my PhD being completed last year that I'm sort of working on. I'm also involved as a member of the Computer Applications in Archaeology Australasian uh, organization as well. I'm assistant Treasurer and Public Officer. And basically this organization is all about trying to promote how technological applications are being used for archaeology, whether it be 3D um, geographic information systems, using drones, um, geophysics, all this type of stuff. And even though I'm not a major specialist in some of the technologies that are there, I've delved in some of them. I feel that being able to talk to people who come from such specialist backgrounds in mathematics, science, who use these technologies quite a bit can help to be that voice to sort of um, bring them on board with certain projects where their expertise can help with archaeology projects and to bring some multidisciplinary uh, conversations and projects. And this is so important in many ways because this is applicable to any industry mm. where for you in sales, I suppose, yeah. you'd be talking to clients where, they're looking for something to address some sort of industrial problem that they're facing with their company or business. True, that's true. Yeah. And in that sort of sense through your connections and understanding what's going on with them, you'll be able to talk to somebody from a completely different background and sort of bring them to the table for a conversation over a coffee or something like that. And from there you get interesting collaborations and it's from that, like, you know, this is where human projects grow and mold themselves. People think like, how were the pyramids built? Well, it was because of teamwork in that sort of sense. Mm. We don't have a blueprint from it, but this is the idea. But to, to continue on with explaining your question, for me, I've got teaching to do next semester. Where I'll be teaching landscape archaeology for AHIS 2300. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking over Zoom with my students, hopefully making it engaging for them. Um, I'm hoping that mid next year, I'll be able to work again in Egypt with my colleagues from the Gebelin archaeological project as well, headed yes. by uh, Wojciech Ejmon from Poland. Um, and uh, there's, there's also other little projects here and there I'm involved with, but uh, stay tuned. But uh, at the present moment, I'm really appreciative of this podcast and how to sort of like share my story, especially um, for families who have kids who have learning difficulties growing up. Um, again, you know, I have a lot of people to thank for, but at the end of the day, my parents are some of the best role models I have in my life without their support, their love, their dedication, their hard work, um, from all those psychology speech mm -hmm. therapy lessons when I was a kid, when I had no idea about how to speak yeah. from the early mornings and the afternoons, working with me at home to do extra homework and all that type of stuff, just so I could keep up in the classroom as well. And even little things up until now, you know, dad just give me a good listening ear on some walks and talking with him and my mum being good emotional support and that sort of sense to understand different aspects of life. Yeah, Rob, I wouldn't be here without them. But I mean, there's a lot that I've done myself, but again, yeah. this support network is, um, it's, it's, it's a real blessing, a, a real blessing. I think honestly, you are who you are, not just where you want to be done by yourself, but who you hang around with, especially, and not just my family, but some very important close and dear friends to me who I'm still in contact with, whether they be from school, uh, university, um, because you want to search for people who help you grow. And this is part of the aspect of no matter what relationship you're in, that you want to be continually connected with people who you support, they support you, no matter whether you hmm. see them often or not. Um, again, it's, it's just making sure that for the rest of my life in terms of the next challenges, I hope I continually as well um, build on the relationships that I have right now. Some may last, some may not, and that's okay. That's part of life. But I'm also excited for whatever new relationships I have with people of various walks of life, thanks to what I've done in archaeology. And they're, they're coming right along soon, so I can't wait for that.
Mate, if they say you are the five people you associate the most with, and that's outside of your family. Yeah. If you've got a young boy or girl who's finishing up school this year, doesn't know if they want to do uni, doesn't want to do TAFE or work, and they met you in the street and we got introduced to you and I said, look, this is a young man. He started from, you know, just a, a normal part of Sydney and has now travelled the world. He's spoken at international conferences. He's now teaching at uni. And they turned around and said to you, if you could give me one minute's worth of advice, what would you tell someone who's just starting, really just starting on their journey of life as they're walking out of school where nothing matters anymore, the cool kids, everyone walks out the same? What would you say to them? Yeah. I mean, when no one knew, you didn't know when you were in year 10 or 9 at school that you would have achieved what you achieved. So... Yeah. What do you do with, with a child like that? First and foremost, I would say to them, like, have you got, have you got a minute's worth of time? Because this could go for one more minute. But, uh, <laughs> but if I could put it down to a minute, I would first ask them, like, what do you enjoy doing? Yeah. What, honest to God, what do you enjoy doing the most right now? Because if, if, it is some, if you can have an understanding about what you enjoy doing, would be reading, uh, writing things, riding your bike, doing Instagram videos or filming yourself and all that. If you get a real kick out of that, then there's something connected to that. And you've got to, you've got to really ask yourself some honest questions. I, anything that I try and do, I get a piece of paper and just write it down. People get yeah, annoyed with me at that time. They're like, well, you always write things down. Like, it's important. It's good for your memory. Um, and I would say to them, like, if you can pinpoint what you enjoy doing, go from that go from that because it could lead you to somewhere. Don't listen to what people say or, you know, people say you should do or something like that. Because honestly, the only person you know that can sort of help you to go where you want to go in life is you. So I would say if you, if you have a, something that you enjoy doing, you love being involved with it or something of yeah. that nature, go for that because that is, that is where passion begins. Um, and just, and just go from there. I, especially for kids who at the end of their schooling years, they still have no idea. And I know kids who have like, um, they finish school, they have no idea what they want to do. Some of them have actually come into some of my classes in archaeology and, you know, oh, I don't know still what to do. Well, well, you're here. It tells me you have an interest. Yeah. So that's probably one of those interests. So I would say like, if you have any interests that you enjoy right now, list them. Just list them. Do some research because... You have, you have your phone, you have computers, you have the internet nowadays at your fingertips where you can get so much information about this. But the first thing to do is write down the interests that you enjoy of being associated with right now and just, and just jump from them as little springboards. Write things down that connect with those things. And who knows, you might come across something in your research or in your things or on social media, hashtags, those interests, if you will, yeah. where it will it will definitely lead you to somewhere, but be dedicated. Yeah. Do a lot of hard work because there'll be times you think it will lead you to dead ends, but just keep going. But in a way, it'll help you realize where those things have dead ends and where things can continually connect. But you've got to be persistent in that sort of sense and, and to not give up and yeah. talk to people you trust about these things too. That's yeah. another thing I would say to them. Now, all my guests end with the last same two questions or the same one question. Yeah. I'm going to say to you, we've just got a rooftop in Marrakesh. There's a, <laughs> uh, a dinner table there for uh, you. I'll just get relaxed. Yep, here we go. Three go. people. <laughs> Sheesh is going off in the corner. Yeah. Who are, the, who are the three people, dead or alive, that you invite for dinner and why? Just very quickly for our listeners. So for a bit of fun as we wind up today's podcast. Ah, oh, geez. Uh, first off the bat will be Mike Shinoda from the band of Linkin Park. Um, love my music on the side and Linkin Park has been one of those influential bands. Um, some don't like them. Others do like them, yep. but at the core of their creativity, Mike Shinoda, yep. uh, definitely. Uh, Craig Ferguson, uh, our, a wonderful comedian who did the late uh, show before James Corden took over in America. I love his Scottish wit. He is one of the best interviewers I've ever watched and how he brings people at ease in the interviews. Is something yes. that I have not seen from any late show host right now. Maybe Conan to a certain extent, but Craig Ferguson yep. definitely he'll bring a laugh. And um, you know, last but not least, anytime I can, I'll get my supervisor over, Yanti Stom. That guy has so many different stories. Look him up. He's a fantastic fellow. 
He does a very good job in giving his confidence and support to his students. And he's just passionate about what he does. And uh, again, like for all that he has done for me, I can never repay, but a good meal, I'll definitely cook it for him. Well, Ollie, or Dr. Ollie as you know him these days, thank you so much for spending the time with us. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear from someone that's achieved so much. I look forward to the day where you are the head of Egyptology in New York or Egypt or even <laughs> Australia. And uh, we can uh, walk in and talk really loud down the end and yell out, hey, Dr. Ollie, where are you? And you'll know there's a <laughs> few crazy Aussies that have watched you on this podcast and uh, gone, I know him. Uh, mate, inshallah, if it happens, God willing in Arabic, if that day comes, if I have the privilege to do that, then God willing, then I would accept it. But you never know in this life. But definitely, Rob, nah, for sure. Wherever I am, mate, you're always welcome for a chat over a beer and a feed. No worries at all. I'm sure this isn't the last we're going to hear from you. You have a fantastic day and thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope that your viewers, your listeners have enjoyed this experience as well. Beautiful.